Excellencies, distinguished participants, good morning. Good morning, and welcome to our first uh, public forum at ISIS, uh, entitled Democratic Control of the Military, the Thailand in Comparative Perspective. Uh, this is our first seminar since uh, the Songkran holidays, so Happy New Year again. This is the third time we can say Happy New Year in Thailand. So, so first we will have uh, some uh, uh, welcoming remarks from uh, Professor Supachai Yawaprapad, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Political Science. So Dan Supachai uh, Shankar. On behalf of the Faculty of Political Science, I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, public forum. And I think the title of the forum is uh, very interesting. That is why uh, one reason that you are here and uh, another reason uh, I think it is the, the speaker and the discussion that will uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, they can share with you the information, the knowledge and uh, also the thought that will uh, be very benefit to, to everyone. So uh, I think uh, I always uh, tell Ajahn Titinan that this kind of public forum is something that we would like to see happen uh, often and more often. With that, uh, I think you, you are waiting to, to, to hear from the speaker. So uh, welcome and thanks for coming here. Thank you very much. Uh, there are a number of case studies in the book and it comes from a project from a few years ago uh, that uh, the study covered, apart from Thailand, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Philippines, Pakistan. So it's a kind of a book that uh, discusses, analyzes the role of civilian control over the military. The, the correlation, the assumption being that you know you cannot really have a good democracy or democratization when the military is still in control. So somehow there has to be a civilian control uh, of the military. And we've made this into a different title, democratic control, uh, just to just to link it with um, democracy, democratization in Thailand. Uh, Aurel Song will have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, it'll be uh, an analytical framework, uh, teasing, provoking us, prodding us to think in certain ways about the role of the military in democracies. Uh, it's a comparative uh, presentation, it's a comparative perspective. But towards the end, we will look at um, Thailand's case, and then uh, after that, we have two discussions. Uh, Professor Banitan Watanayakon, my colleague and friend here, and then um, our uh, colonel, uh, our academic uh, officer from, from the high command, uh, Colonel Tiranant uh, Nantakwang. So Dr. Kwasong is a professor at, um, in Heidelberg, uh, Institute of Political Science, uh, University of Heidelberg. He is a prolific author, uh, commentator, and you have the CV, and uh, uh, I won't go into uh, uh, the length of the CV, so uh, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ajahn Titinan. Uh, thank you very much for attending this book launch uh, this morning, and I'm very, very sorry that there's not a single copy of the book available in this room, except the one uh, Professor Titinan has, but uh, as you pointed out, there are discount flyers, and uh, the discount is about 50%, so if you are still convinced uh, about uh, what I have to say after my talk, uh, I would encourage you to get one of the flyers and, uh, of course, uh, purchase the book. Uh, as Titinan uh, said, uh, I'm going to present the findings of a research project, a four years research project, but I have to add at the beginning that this very much is a collaborative work. So I'm not the only author of this book, but I collaborated with three more researchers in that research project uh, who did much or most of the field work, actually. Uh, that is Paul Chambers, who's actually at uh, Chiang Mai University, uh, David Kuhn and Philip Lorenz, who both uh, do research and teach at Heidelberg University. And that the findings I'm going to present today in the next 42, 43 minutes are based on this four-year research project, which was funded by the German Research Fund. And we did, my colleagues and I, we did uh, field research in each of the seven countries you mentioned, which we compare in the book. And we did about 
180 to 190 semi-structured interviews with uh, officers, military officers, politicians, lawmakers, journalists, social activists, and academics. And it's part of a larger research program on military security and democracy in the world. So that has been the first project and we're now uh, continuing our research at Heidelberg University um, in a research project in which we compare all 80 plus so-called emerging democracies since the early 1970s. And hopefully if we get the funding we will also uh, conduct a five-year research program on the military in non-democratic countries um, in the future. And all that hopefully will come together in the future uh, into a broad research program on security, democracy, and the military in Asia. So what I'm, uh, and in the world. So what I'm going today uh, to do today is I present the findings of this book, which is called Democratization and Civilian Control in Asia. And then, of course, the first question is, why should we study civil military relations? Why not studying security sector? or security sector reform. And civil military relations, of course, is a part of what some scholars call the security sector, which involves all kinds of public and private actors who are involved in uh, providing security in a society. Uh, we focus in that book on civil military relations because we think that the question who guards the guardians is not the only important question. In, in, in the relationship between the security sector and the society, but it is one of the most important questions. And uh, that is because civilian control of the military is a necessary condition for effective democracy. There can be civilian control, and I'm going into the definition of civilian control in a minute. There can, of course, be uh, civilian control of the military without democracy. Think about People's Republic of China the Third Reich in Germany or the Soviet Union. But democracy, effective democracy, is only possible if there is a sufficient degree or extent of civilian control of the military. And what I mean by civilian control uh, is uh, what I will tell you in a minute or so. However, we know from comparative research, and of course everyone in this room has uh, studied Thai politics, so you are familiar with the situation in Thailand, many new democracies are often poorly prepared to face up to a double challenge when it comes to civil military relations. First, developing firm institutions for the democratic control of armed force. This is a very frequent phenomenon. Many new democracies face challenges and problems of developing institutions of civilian and democratic control of their armed forces. That's not an exception. That's not a unique thing for Thailand. It's even not unique for Asia. But if you look at Latin America, West Africa, uh, the Caucasus, Central Asia, you will find that many, many new democracies uh, face this challenge of developing new democratic institutions of control and governing the armed forces. And second, of course, uh, they also have to turn their uh, armed forces into effective tools for the protection and security of their citizens. When I talk about civilian control, I think that's one of the most important issues in civil military. But of course, the only reason why nations have armed forces is because these armed forces, and also the police, intelligence service, whatever you name it, they are supposed to provide security. So the issue of control must be considered in a broader context of democratic control of the armed force, but also military effectiveness and military efficiency. Uh, and uh, there can be a tension between control and military effectiveness. For example, if civilians meddle on a day-by-day -day base uh, in, uh, into military affairs and do micromanagement, so the Vietnam War and the U.S. civil military is a very good example of the tension and sometimes negative consequences of too much civilian control on military effectiveness. But as I said, in this project we focus very much on the civilian control aspect and not so much on the military effectiveness and efficiency aspect. So uh, why Asia? We thought studying Asia would be a nice thing. Studying Asia means studying civil military relations in so-called emerging democracies in Asia because Asia is a kind of a natural laboratory. As you all know, the Asia-Pacific region is so diverse 
that at a first glance you would say, oh, it's almost impossible to compare these cases. My argument is because the Asia Pacific is so diverse, it provides us with an idle surrounding for doing comparative analysis. Because if findings in a region as diverse as Asia Pacific can be produced, general findings, it's very likely that these findings will hold also in other regions. So we made a virtue out of the diversity of Asia, and we focused on seven cases, as Professor Titinan mentioned in his introduction. We focused on Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, the Philippines, South Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand. And all these countries shared two similarities. First of all, in the 1980s and 1990s, these countries transitioned from non-democratic rule to something else. Some countries transitioned to consolidated democracy, like Korea and uh, Taiwan. Others transitioned from non-democratic rule to partially democratic, uh, partially democratic political order, like uh, Indonesia, the Philippines. And in some countries, some cases, the so-called transition to democracy clearly failed. And that's Pakistan and, as you all know, uh, Thailand with a coup in 2006. At least that's the argument in the book, and we can, of course, debate that. So uh, they all face first the challenge of transitioning from non-democratic to democratic rule. And second, they all face the double challenge of introducing institutions for democratic civilian control and reconciling, reconciling these institutions with the aim of military effectiveness and efficiency. There are many, many differences between the cases, of course, as I said, but I think the large diversity of this sample of seven Asian cases ensures that our insights can to some extent be generalized and they can travel to other regions. So let me emphasize again, uh, also I, I, I know this is not a, a, a graduate seminar, it's not a PhD course, but let me emphasize again, I think the diversity increases the robustness of our causal inferences. It's not a problem of, for generalization, but it, uh, it makes generalization more, uh, more likely. Also, of course, generalizing from seven cases is always a problem. Okay, so um, why do we think it's necessary to do another research on civil military relations and civilian control in Asia? Three reasons. First of all, we think the conceptual understanding of civilian control in, in most of the previous research on civil military relations in Asia and other regions is deficient because civilian control is often defined as the absence of a military coup d'etat. The argument then goes, if there is no coup d'etat or military putsch, then there is civilian control. Obviously, this is a very, very crude understanding of civilian control. You could also argue there is no military coup because the military is so powerful, so strong, so influential. It doesn't have to stage a coup in order to realize its interests. So we think we need a better concept, a better understanding of uh, uh, civil in control. Second, our, under, uh, our feeling, we found that most of the research that is available either focuses on a single case, for example, on Thailand, or a single region, and most of the time it's Latin America. There is nothing wrong about focusing on a single case or a single region. Case studies are wonderful, and the book contains seven case studies, which are then compared. The problem, of course, is if you focus only on one case, it's almost impossible to produce any insights about causal uh, relationships. What does A cause B? Uh, to answer these questions, what factors allow for civilian control? What factors uh, render civilian control more difficult? How does civilian control affect the working of democracy? It's necessary to compare. A second, uh, Latin America is a region where most of the research on civil military relations has been done in the past. The problem, of course, is the Latin American cases are very similar to each other, but very different from cases in other regions. So in Latin America in the 1970s, you had a, practically in, in, in most countries, you had a military regime which ruled the country for about five to 15 years, depending on the case, and then the transition took place from military rule to democracy. And they all have the same language. They are pretty much the same social structure, same economic system, same economic structure. So uh, the cases are very similar, but very different from cases in other regions, like Asia, for example, or Western Africa. So the insights gained from studies of Latin American transitions from military rule to civilian control may not be 
uh, uh, may not be valid for other regions. So we thought it would be necessary or it would be nice to do a research on uh, Asia. And third, we thought we found that most of the research actually talks more about stories, what happened when and where and who did what, than providing really analytical uh, um, exercises and analysis of civil military relations. And many contributions in the field actually deal with untestable or rely on untestable assumptions. You are all probably familiar with Samuel Huntington's professionalism thesis. This is a very interesting theory, but it's not an analytical theory, it's not an empirical theory, and you cannot test the validity of that theory because it's almost impossible to operationalize and measure and identify professionalism because we don't have the necessary data. And that's even true for countries like uh, uh, the new NATO membership countries in Eastern Europe. So it's an interesting theory, some would say at least, uh, uh, but it's not possible to test its basic assumptions. So we thought we need to, if we deal with theory, we should have a theory which can be tested so that we learn more about the validity of the theoretical assumptions and claims. So that uh, then uh, leads us to four research questions. First one, how to conceptualize civilian control. Second, what is the state of civilian control in Asia? Third, why do democracies fail or succeed in achieving uh, control over the military and fourth of course what are the policy implications also this is not a policy paper this book it does not deal primarily with policy implication of course the question then remains what what could policymakers learn from from the study or what could they take home uh, uh, from our study so uh, let me deal with the first research question how to conceptualize civilian control uh, we know from various research in Asia and in other regions that many of the transition processes in the so-called third wave, which started in the early 1970s in Portugal, have reached a standstill in the early 21st century. Often partial democracies emerge, and these partial democracies suffer from forms of military interventionism that are very different from a coup d'etat. If you look at the statistics, and we really have good data on uh, the frequency of military coup d'etats since World War II until basically uh, today, you will see that the number of military coups, and Thailand of course is an exception, and it's interesting to discuss why Thailand is an exception, but if you're from the global picture, you see that the number of military coups failed or, or successful coups uh, de is declining since the 1970s, and it's dramatically declining. And the number of, of direct military regimes is decreasing, and it's dramatic degrees, and it's a, a sustainable reduction in the number of military coups and military regimes. Um, but they suffer from other forms of military interventionism. That means the military decides policies in many countries, and which policies then, of course, depends on the case. Uh, and it, it has so-called, or enjoys so-called uh, prerogatives and veto powers. So because the military, and you could make the argument, and we make the argument, for example, for the Philippines and also uh, to some extent for Thailand, uh, because the military enjoys prerogatives and veto powers, there is no necessity for the military to stage a coup because it can realize its interests uh, with means different or means other than uh, a military coup. Uh, and so we need a concept of civilian control that is able to identify these forms of military intervention into civilian politics. So we need to avoid what we call the fallacy of coupism. The fallacy of coupism basically is if there is a coup, there is no civilian control. If there is no coup, there is civilian control. Uh, and uh, we think in order to avoid the fallacy of coupism, it's necessary to describe civil military relations, and that's a typo, in terms of a continuum of distribution of decision-making power between civilians and the military. And we differentiate our concept into five areas of civil-military relations. Area uh, uh, A, the first area, is leadership selection. Who decides on the recruitment and selection of political leaders and representatives? Uh, the second area is public policies. Who 
has the authority to decide public policies. Third is internal security, who controls decision making in the area of internal security. A fourth is external or national defense against external threats. And uh, E, the fifth area, is military organization. And in the book, we argue that basically we can imagine civil military relations and civilian control as a continuum between, with the two poles or two extreme points, uh, complete, full, total military control over one or more than one of these five areas. And the other idle point uh, or idle scenario would be total, complete civilian control over decision making in one or more than one of these five areas. And we call civilian control or define civilian control as that distribution of decision making power in one or more than one of these five areas in which civilians have exclusive authority to decide on national policies and their implementation. So what we do in the book is we use that five area concept, which then is operationalized in a number of different indicators and variables. We use that five area uh, concept of civilian control and that understanding of civilian control as a gradual phenomenon on a continuum from perfect military control to, to complete or perfect civilian control to analyze all seven countries in Asia, including Thailand. And I'm, I'm not going to bother you with the technical details of the <coughs> operationalization and the measurement, but we can, of course, uh, I'd be glad to uh, elaborate uh, the methodology. Um, so uh, just real quick what civilian control is not. It's not to be equated with democratic control. In democracies, civilian control has to be democratic. That's pretty obvious. But as I said in the beginning of my talk, there are historical examples and current examples of civil military relations in which civilians control the military, but these civilians are not democratically elected and legitimized. As I said, People's Republic of China is an example, or Soviet Union, uh, Nazi uh, dictatorship in Germany, uh, you name it. There are many, many autocracies, non-democratic regimes, uh, where uh, political leaders, civilians, are able to control the military. So civilian control is not to be equated with democratic control. Only if we talk about democracies and civilian control in democracies, then we talk about democratic control. Second, as I said, uh, civilian control is not the only important issue in civil military relations. There are many, many other also very important questions. We focus on this single question because we come from the uh, democratization literature and we are interested in the question who guards the guardians in emerging democracy. But as I said, it's not the only question. It's not the only important question. And third, if we talk about civilian control and that definition, we do not assume an apolitical military. Militaries are always political institutions. The very purpose, the very function, the responsibility of the military is to advise decision makers on security policies. So the military per definition, or by definition, is involved in the political process. And it would be actually a very absurd situation if a country, a nation, would spend billions of dollars on the military, but then the civilians who make uh, security policies, who decide security policies, don't talk to the military. And that's absurd. That's not our point. And uh, the military is, uh, of course, a bureaucratic institution. Some would say, depends on the case, how bureaucratic it is. And all bureaucratic institutions, for example, share the same interest, budget maximization or budget maximizing. So they are always involved in lobbying, in the policy making process. The thing is, uh, if we talk about democratic control, uh, and we assume that in a democracy, the democratically legitimate or legitimized uh, decision makers, the civilians, the elected civilians, should be uh, in control of the military. The military's function is to advise, but not to decide. Okay, so civilian control in Asia, uh, or in Asian emerging democracies, what did we find out? What, were our, what are our findings? As I said before, there are many differences in Asia in regard to the so-called initial conditions, the starting conditions from which, the conditions from which new democracies 
uh, uh, start uh, with the endeavor and the challenge to uh, uh, institutionalize uh, democratic control. There are many differences in regard to the pre-democratic settings, what political scientists used to call the type of authoritarian regime. So for example, in Taiwan, some of you may be familiar with the Taiwanese case or case of Taiwan. In Taiwan, it was a single party regime of the Kuomintang, the nationalist party. Uh, it was a civilian authoritarian regime uh, in, controlled by uh, a undemocratic uh, single party under a, uh, a political leader, Chiang Kai-shek, until the early 1970s, mid-1970s, and then his son and later on Li deng um, uh, in, in Thailand, of course, it was a military regime from which transition start, started in 92. Then, of course, many differences in regard to the military's involvement in processes of democratic transition. For example, in Taiwan, the military did not play a meaningful or an important or relevant role in the process of democratic transition in the sense that the military did not influence the process of constitutional reform, uh, democratizing elections, legalizing political parties, increasing uh, civil rights. While in, in a country like South Korea, the military had very strong influence on the democratic transition, so strong that the first democratically elected president, freely and fair elected president in South Korea in 88, 87 election and 88 his term start, uh, no Tae-woo, he was a former military general and he was part of the core group of the authoritarian regime and he was involved in the 1980 military coup. So the military had very strong influence on the transition to democracy, also in Pakistan. And again, as I said, in Taiwan, not so strong in Bangladesh, for example, also the military, for various reasons, did not play a strong role in the democratic transition. Uh, then, of course, domestic and international environments in which democratization and military reform took place were very different, of course. Imagine the case of Taiwan and South Korea, two countries which faced in the 1980s and until today a serious external threat to their national integrity and national survival, or survival as a nation state. Uh, China, mainland China, and of course North Korea. In, 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 in a country like Bangladesh, there was no external threat. Neither Pakistan nor India constitute, or Myanmar constitute in the early 90s, a strong or a, a harsh external threat. In, in Thailand, you can debate how, how relevant, how real the external threat really was after the end of the Indochina wars. Uh, and of course, the military's role in economy and society it was very different in these seven cases. On the one hand, there's of course Pakistan with its huge mill bus military business complex. Uh, and the military for decades controlled uh, large parts of the economy, of the civilian administration, was really strongly institutionalized in the civilian society. On the other hand, for example, in South Korea, the military had a strong presence in civilian administration, but there was no military business complex. Uh, and again, in Taiwan, for example, the military's role in economy was very weak, and even in society, it was not well institutionalized. Again, if we talk about Thailand, and I'm doing show you the difference in Thailand, of course, you could say the military's socioeconomic roles were rather strong at the beginning of the transition. So you see here the summary of the differences and similarities between the cases in regard to the initial conditions. And uh, I just want to highlight the initial conditions in Thailand. Uh, the origin of the old authoritarian regime in 91, of course, was a military coup. We are all familiar with the story of the Sushinda coup. It was a military regime. I would say also there was a civilian uh, interim government. The military junta basically ran the show. Uh, the transition was affected by the military. The military played a role in the uh, negotiation of the transitions, uh, negotiations of the transition from uh, authoritarian to a democratic system. There were military factions. The military was strongly factionalized. Uh, there was a only weak tradition of civilian control, and the military played a strong economic and uh, socio-economic role. And so from the initial conditions, we would expect that Thailand in 92, 93 was an unlikely candidate for civilian control. But the same is true, for example, for Indonesia. And the example I mentioned before, uh, South Korea also would be a rather unlikely candidate for civilian control. 
So while this table summarizes our argument regarding the initial conditions and the initial conditions for civilian control were rather problematic in the case of Thailand. There are other cases in Asia which face similarly difficult background conditions or initial conditions, but the outcome was very different. The outcome in the case of Thailand, we argue in the book, and the book covers the period from 92 until 2010. We argue in the book the outcome in, ter uh, in regard to uh, civil military reforms was failure of uh, civilian control, failure to institutionalize civilian control. Some would say, given these initial conditions, you would expect that. So what's the surprising thing here? What's the big news? Well, the initial conditions, as I said, were also not favorable or did not favor civilians in Indonesia and South Korea. But the outcome is very different because South Korea, South Korean democracy, the civilians in South Korea were successful in their attempt to institutionalize civilian control. And Indonesia, at least given the circumstances, given the initial conditions, it's a, it's a remarkable outcome that uh, uh, Indonesia's democracy or democratic institutions were able to strengthen at least civilian control. So, uh, the bottom line, the message from this table is, in our book, that we argue, yes, initial conditions are important. Civil military reforms do not take place in a social or historical vacuum. History matters, but history does not bound civilians. It constrains, it provides challenges or resources, but as we see here, very different outcomes which cannot be explained by the initial conditions. So what did we found out in terms of civilian control? You will remember we have these five different partial regimes of civilian control. We operationalized them, we tried to measure them in a qualitative sense. I can tell you more about that uh, in the discussion. But the main findings then are summarized here in this uh, table or figure. And it follows a simple, a very simple logic. And that's only for the purpose of presenting a summary of the findings. Of course, the argument in the book is more uh, complex, I hope at least. Uh, the logic of the table is very simple. It's a traffic light logic. Red means military dominates the decision-making area. Yellow means there are significant limits on civilian control. You could say decision-making power, decision-making authority is shared by civilians and the military. And green means civilians dominate. They control decision-making in that area and they control therefore the military. Uh, and uh, you see here also uh, the research period, South Korea, our research covers the period from 87 to 2010. 87 was the year of transition to democracy. Um, and you see in 87, 88, there was only very weak civilian control in South Korea, which is unsurprising given the fact that the old authoritarian regime was a civilianized military regime. Uh, but in 2010, and we just, we, we we finished our research in 2010. That's why I say 2010 means December 2010. Of course, you could extend the research until 2012, 2013, but that's not in the book, so I don't want to uh, create the impression that our book presents findings for the period until 2013. That would simply be not correct. So 2010, you see full, according to our findings, fully institutionalized civilian control in South Korea, and the same in Taiwan. So these two countries are, if you want to uh, uh, summarize the finding in that way, are the successful cases of institutionalization, institutionalizing civilian control. In Indonesia, Bangladesh, and the Philippines, you see here, they form kind of a th second group. Uh, the civilian control has increased, was strengthened uh, during the democratic transition and then the uh, period of democratization until 2010, but the military still shares decision-making authority in various areas. And I just want to highlight the case of the Philippines. That was before the uh, Aquino administration. President Aquino was elected in 2011, uh, or his term started in 2010, 2011. So we deal here basically with uh, uh, Ramos, uh, uh, Cory Aquino, and uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. And our findings, uh, well, show a rather skeptical assessment of the state of civilian control and civil military relations in the Philippines until uh, the Aquino administration. As you will see in Thailand in 2010, so before the last election and before the Yinlak government uh, 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 was formed, the coalition government was built, uh, 
our finding was that there only was very weak civilian control. And by civilian control, because we deal here with democratization process, we mean civilian authority over decision making in each of these five areas. And by civilians, we mean, first of all, uh, uh, political parties, uh, parliament, uh, and, and, and the cabinet and government. So democratically, hopefully democratically elected institutions. And uh, the findings for Thailand are very similar uh, compared to Pakistan. Though so these two cases, and I'm sure we're going to have a debate about that, uh, these two cases uh, build the group of failed or unsuccessful institutionalization of civilian control. And I'm sure there are going to be many discussions and many debates about uh, the specific details, but that's what we argue in the book. And then, of course, the question is how can we explain these different uh, findings? And how can we explain, for example, the difference between civilian control in the era, uh, area of internal security and the lack of civilian control in the era, uh, area of national defense? So that's what the rest of the book is about, how to explain these findings. So the first part of the book deals with uh, identifying, tracing the extent, the degree, the development, the quality of civilian control. The second part of the book, of the case studies, deal with the attempt to make sense out of our findings, how to explain these findings. And I just want to summarize the findings before I then talk a little bit more about Thailand. Well, uh, one of the main findings in our book is, as I mentioned before, military and other security forces today are more likely to endanger democracy by lessening the quality and depth than by threatening its outright uh, and swift overthrow. So how the military intervenes in domestic politics in most of these countries is very different from our uh, conventional idea understanding of military politics staging a coup or threatening to stage a coup. That's not usually the way the military influences politics. They constrain civilian decision making authority by saving or controlling certain policy areas. So uh, creating informal and formal institutions which guarantee the military a say or control over decision making and make coups unnecessary, usually. And then, of course, the question is what explains the 2006 coup in Thailand. Perhaps the weakness or the erosion of control over different areas of civil military relations, which then triggers or creates a backslash from the military. Uh, and most difficult to institutionalize is democratic control over internal security, national defense, and military organization. These are the three policy areas in civil military where it's really difficult to institutionalize civilian control. Why is that? One argument would be, well, civilians lack usually the knowledge about national defense. Uh, think about Thailand. Where is the uh, civilian defense knowledge in this country? There is some. I mean, the two uh, people on this panel demonstrate that, that there is some civilian defense knowledge, but often, or, or overall, civilian defense knowledge is very weak. So how can civilians control defense policy if they don't know anything about defense policy? Well, if worth, they don't have to be experts, at least they, they should know what they need to know and what is not necessary to know. But that kind of knowledge is often lacking. Uh, military organization is very difficult for civilians to control because this is really the, the core interest of the military, to control its own internal affairs. So very difficult for civilians to control. Um, uh, if we look at Thailand, as a, uh, a quick glance at the case of Thailand, uh, of course we did uh, differentiate in our analysis each case into different periods and phases. This is just to demonstrate how we did it in Thailand. In our analysis, we uh, differentiated four different periods in Thailand. One was 92 to 2000, second was the Thaksin period, third was of course the uh, well, let's call it uh, the post-coup interim government period. And then the, the fourth period was from 2007, 2008 until 2010. And you will see, of course, the extent, the degree, the quality of civilian control it varies over time. It's not always the same uh, uh, static uh, situation, but it varies over time. But um, uh, I don't want to go into the details, but we can discuss that. 
So why do democracies fail or succeed in achieving uh, control of the military? If there is one message from the book and uh, one single factor to to identify and of course as as a as a political scientist and as a scholar I always hesitate to to name or mention one factor as the only or most important factor because it's always complex various factors uh, uh, come together uh, difficult uh, to reduce a complex process uh, um, uh, to uh, one factor but if there is one one factor which needs to be highlighted it is that progress in civil military reforms and uh, progress in the institutionalization of civilian control over the military can only be achieved if there is progress in the general process of democratization that is i think a very important uh, argument and you may disagree with that because usually most of the most of the research argues Democratization is affected by civil military relations and the military. The military either supports democracy or the military, the armed forces, they constrain democracy. And because the military is so powerful, democracy is lacking quality. Our argument is exactly the other way around. The military can exercise control over or intervene in policy making processes and can control uh, certain decision making processes and areas because democracy is weak so it's really a different of course in reality the causality goes both ways but it's really a different uh, a causal argument we argue democratization affects civil military relations and the stronger or the more promising the process of democratization, the better the prospects for achieving uh, uh, reforms and, and civilian control over the military. And that's the most, I think the most important, or we think the most important factor. Second, of course, that's very conventional. Our argument goes uh, domestic armed conflict influences the process of uh, institutionalizing demo democratic control and it's very difficult to institutionalize dem democratic control if there are internal armed conflicts in a country like in the south of course uh, the patani conflict or in the philippines the mindanao conflict uh, why <coughs> sorry why is that because if there are armed domestic conflicts or domestic armed conflicts the civilians need the military to deal with the internal security situation that strengthens the military uh, uh, the argument would go a third pre-democratic legacies and processes of transition uh, are important they create past dependencies difficult to break but they can be broken and the fourth argument is challenges are harder to overcome if armed forces are unified. That's also, I, find, I think, an important finding if we talk about Thailand, because usually the argument goes the history of coups in Thailand has something to do with the factionalization of the Thai military. At least in the past, many coups were faction coups or factional coups. One faction staged a coup against the other faction, which is true, of course. Um, uh, but the, our findings suggest that civilians can deal more successful with the challenge of institutionalizing control over the armed forces if the armed forces are factionalized. A unified, homogeneous, cohesive military uh, possess a much stronger bargaining power or bargaining potential vis-a-vis -vis the civilians than a factionalized military. So, uh, also, what, what, what's important, uh, uh, what it can explain uh, different uh, results, different outcomes in terms of institutionalizing civilian control? Uh, we think the seven cases we studied in our book uh, show very clear that before undertaking a process of reform, civ civil military reforms, the civilians must be sure that the necessary prerequisites are in place in order to proceed with these reforms. And what are the prerequisites? First, a consensus between democratic forces that must translate into support from the legislature for the legislature for the changes planned. So one precondition for successful reform in civil military relations is strong civilian support for reforms in civil military relations. Again, I see the problem. It's it. I emphasize the prerequisites uh, which are related with civilian politics and not the prerequisites 
associated or uh, affiliated related to the military. For example, I don't think military professionalism has any meaningful explanatory power when it comes to security sector reform or uh, civilian control. Professionalism, I know that's co controversial. I think professionalism is not a useful concept. It's not a useful uh, uh, analytical tool. It's not a, a powerful explanation for civilian control. In none of our cases, not Taiwan, not South Korea, professionalism can explain why military was not, why the military was not under civilian control before, let's say, 2000, 2005, but is now under civilian control. Uh, so the first precondition is civilian support for reforms, uh, which aim to institutionalize civilian control. And second, an agreement between political parties and civilian elites that they will not seek the armed forces support for their respective stances. So uh, agreement between civilians that they will not use this famous knocking at the barrack doors strategy, pulling the military into their own power struggles. And of course, we all know that both preconditions may not exist in Thailand right now, or may be weak. That's the argument in the book. So uh, uh, also what we found out, and that relates to the policy implications, the engine of military reform must be domestic government and institutions. external programs, external cooperation and security sector reform in democratizing civil military relations. It's all nice. I've been involved in that, in that kind of programs when I was teaching uh, in the United States at a military university. It's all nice, but I doubt it. At, first of all, we know very little about the effects, the effectiveness of these programs. That's a problem. And second, to us it seems pretty clear that external cooperation uh, um, uh, can not work without strong domestic uh, consensus and, 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 and forces which want to democratize and want to reform civil military relations. So the engine must be domestic governments, institutions, civil society, political parties. Uh, second, military reform must be envisioned as a gradual process and it contains a necessary element of trial and error. In all seven cases, even the most successful one, institutionalizing civilian control was a gradual process. It took about 15, 20 years in Taiwan and South Korea to really institutionalize civilian control. And that's pretty much uh, similar, or that, that, uh, that finding uh, is similar to findings from other regions, which all show institutionalized civilian control is a gradual process. And the, difficult, the greatest difficulties do not derive from the drafting or approval of laws. They arise when efforts are made to reinforce these laws. So it's not the creation of institutions, but it's the implementation of institutions which create or which, are, uh, which is the most difficult part of civil military reforms. So let's look in the past or in the last uh, uh, eight minutes, let's look uh, uh, at the case of Thailand. Um, well, first of all, we could argue, uh, well, the finding in the book is until 2010, December 2010, there was only very weak civilian control in Thailand in the period 2008 to 2010, considerably weaker than, uh, let's say, in the period 92 uh, to 2000. But of course, uh, Panitan, uh, he, he will certainly share his, uh, his understanding and this insight. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if you agree or disagree with the finding, but uh, that's why we have a panel, I guess. Uh, so, uh, are the prerequisites for democratic control in place in Thailand? Well, I said the most important is uh, strong civilian consensus, strong civilian support, an agreement between political actors, parties of course, that they will not seek the armed forces support. My understanding is that this consensus might be either weak or there is no consensus among civilians, that they will not pull the military into their power struggle. And uh, then second, is there maximum support from political leads for democ democratic control of the armed services? Again, I say no. The argument would be there is, my argument would be there's only very weak support among civilians for democratic, for reforms which would institutionalize democratic control. It's more about who, con who controls, who has access to the military, who can deal with the military for partisan purposes, 
for own political interests, but not institutionalizing democratic civilian control. At least there is, uh, I would say, weak support. So is there civilian defense knowledge in parliament, for example, think tanks? Again, it's weak. Of course, there are think tanks. Of course, there are people in the political process who understand, who know something about uh, uh, defense policy, civil military relations, security policy. But it's very weak, the defense knowledge. And civilian defense knowledge uh, uh, is not a, a necessary condition for institutionalized civilian control. But the argument would be, well, it might be, uh, it might uh, make demo institutionalizing democratic civilian control easier if civilians actually know something about the military, the security services, and the defense apparatus. And that's pretty weak in Thailand, which is not, by the way, a unique Thai thing, but it's a frequent problem in many young democracies, or new democracies, in many countries in Asia and other regions. So uh, then uh, some other uh, 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 factors we identify in the book which support uh, the institutionalization of civilian control is, for example, a genuinely civilian defense ministry with full authority and oversight capacity. And I, and I want to emphasize genuinely a real civilian defense ministry, not a ministry which is headed by a former general uh, or which is led by a civilian, but the whole staff in that ministry is active service uh, military officers, but a real civilian defense ministry seems to be an important institution. And this uh, 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 generally civilian defense ministry needs to have full authority and oversight capacity over the military, not a civilian uh, uh, defense ministry that has actually no authority and no oversight over the military. That's, for example, the case in Indonesia. The, Defense ministry has been civilianized, but the defense ministry has no real authority over the military. Then, of course, a prerequisite for democratic control is civilian oversight of military budget, military economy, and military intelligence. It's very difficult to, uh, to exercise democratic control over the military if the military enjoys financial and economic autonomy. There may be reasons, other reasons in a country why the military should have financial autonomy, should engage, should be a part of the civilian economy. Uh, well, some, some historical reasons or, uh, or lack of funding, lack of state resources. And that's another question. For civilian democratic control, civilian oversight of military budget is a necessary precondition. And then uh, one last thing, and I just mentioned it because I think it's relevant for Thailand. Uh, uh, our, uh, our analysis points to the, the, the fact that joint military civilian bodies which have decision-making power, a national security council with decision-making power, an internal security authority with decision-making power, joint military civilian bodies with decision-maker making power render institutionalization of democratic civilian control more difficult. So if there are joint civil military or uh, military civilian bodies, they should not have decision making power. They should only be, uh, they should only advise but not make decisions. Well, the case of Thailand, then, of course, the question is where to locate the problem. Why is there a problem with civilian control? It's, is it on the military side or is it the civilians? Of course, it's both. But uh, I think at least our, our analysis seems to indicate, our findings seems to indicate that if we can reduce the complex research question and phenomenon of civil-military relations to the, to the term problem, then the problem more often is on the civilian side than on the military side. And uh, uh, as Nasser Serra, former Secretary of Defense uh, of the Kingdom of Spain, he was Minister uh, or Secretary of Defense uh, between 82 and 90, and he's usually considered one of the most successful defense ministers ever uh, in, in Spain and many new democracies. He's, he's written a wonderful book in 2010 uh, uh, in which he analyzes the institutionalization of civilian control, democratic control over the military in Spain. Uh, and his argument. I mean, our, our findings really support his argument. It's, that's why I quote from the book, an army that is being courted is an army that is difficult to reform. It's that simple. Of course, 
uh, there are many other factors, but if civilians decide to court the military because they think the military is, is a valuable resource and is set for their own power struggle, then it's difficult to reform the military. And uh, I think uh, uh, Nasus really uh, hits the nail on its head. Hits the nail on its head. That's that's uh, uh, obviously a very uh, uh, very huge problem. And let me spend the last two minutes because Tijinan asked me to say something about it, uh, uh, about the prospects in Thailand. And uh, well, uh, the, the question, for example, is one question would be uh, uh, what are the prospects for institutionalizing democratic control in the future? Well, my argument would be. The, Prospects are not that promising in the short run because some prerequisites are either missing or, or weak. Uh, uh, could there be, for, uh, for example, ever be another coup in Thailand? Well, uh, as, I, as I said, the whole message of the book is, or one of the basic arguments in the book is, civilian control, democratic control is more complex than preventing military coups. Well, but obviously that's a that's an issue in Thailand. So uh, yeah, I, I, I took the opportunity uh, to to think a little bit about that. And if you if you look at the statistics, and we have really good data now, really good data on military coups. Thailand is number five in the world in terms of military coups in the period 46 2000 to 2010. So uh, if you count the, the number of coups, the frequency of military coups failed and successful in that period, Thailand will actually be the fifth most most coup-prone country in the world. That's interesting. The most coup-prone country in the world is Ecuador, number two is Bolivia, and number three is Syria. But in, uh, when it comes to Syria, the last coup took place in, I think, 70, 1970, uh, or 69. So, uh, um, Thailand is, has a strong, a long history of military coups. At the same time, we know countries can escape the coup trap. There are countries in the world. There are a number of cases of countries which also had a high frequency, face a high frequency of military coups, like for example Argentina, I mentioned Syria, or South Korea. But they somehow were able, these countries, political systems, were able to prove the political system against the threat of a military coup. And there's lots of research uh, out there which, uh, which identifies three factors that seem to, to influence or determine the coup risk, so the probability for the occurrence of a military coup. And these st three structural factors are the strength of civil society, the strength of legitimacy of the political order or regime, and the frequency of military coups in the past. Strength of civil society, the stronger civil society, the more, uh, uh, um, more risky, more dangerous it is for the military or civilians and the military. Most coups are based on a civilian military coup coalition. It's not the military which comes up with that fancy idea to storm the palace, uh, the side of the government. It's usually a coalition between civilians and military officers. The stronger the uh, civil society, the more difficult it is to stage a successful coup. So strong civil society reduces the coup risk. Second, that's uh, almost a tautology, one, uh, one could argue. Strength of, the strength of the legitimacy of the existing political order is important to estimate the coup risk. The stronger the legitimacy of the existing political order, uh, the less likely it is that a coup will take place. Again, the argument is pretty much the same. The stronger the legitimacy of the existing order, uh, the higher the costs for uh, uh, conducting a successful military coup. The less, uh, the weaker is the support in society and among civilian elites and among the military probably for uh, toppling uh, the existing regime or government. So uh, the stronger the legitimacy, the less likely is a coup. And frequency of military coups in the past also is an important factor because military officers learn how to stage coups. It's a simple, they have a learning curve. Like any other social actor, Sometimes it's steep and sometimes it's flat, uh, but uh, military officers have a learning curve and they learn how to conduct coups. And, and political actors learn in countries which face a high frequency of military coups, uh, uh, political actors learn that coups matter, that coups work, that coups can be a successful instrument or tool for a changing government. So. The more coups in the past, the likelier it is that a coup will take place in the future. So Thailand is a high-risk coup-prone country. 
given all three uh, factors, uh, civil society is is growing, is deepening, but still some would say it's, it, it's deeply polarized, it's not that strong. Uh, legitimacy of the existing government and the political regimes seem, seems to me to be contested. And uh, there was a high frequency of military coups in the past. So uh, Thailand is a high risk coup prone country. Yet, as I said, countries can escape the coup trap. Coups may be rare in both high and low risk countries. A high risk country, Syria for example, or South Korea until the early 90s, mid 90s, was a high coup risk country. Weak civil society, contested legitimacy of the political order, and a, a, a large frequency, high frequency of military coups in the past. But countries can escape the coup trap. And uh, uh, um, to explain why countries that face a high risk <coughs> may or may not face frequent coups, it's important to look at the agencies or what political actors actually do. So it's civilian agency, government agency, civil society agency, uh, political parties agency, that explains why some high-risk countries like Thailand face frequent coups while other high-risk countries do not. Uh, and, uh, well, the research on military coups points to three important uh, elements which then seem to explain if countries, why countries uh, experience coups. Uh, is there the formation of a uh, uh, coup coalition? Are civilians able to block the formation of coup coalitions? Second, are countries able to address problems of inequality? I, I can elaborate on that in, uh, in the debate, in the discussion, discussion but uh, socioeconomic inequality seems to be a very, very important factor when it comes to explain uh, coups. So can civilians, can governments deal successfully with the problem of inequality? And third, do they develop techniques of democratic coup proving? For example, bringing civil society, bringing think tanks in uh, into the process of reforming civil military relations? Are they able to institutionalize strong links with society, thereby proving the existing political order against the threat of, of a, uh, a coup? And uh, well, I guess it's up to our Thai colleagues to, uh, to provide an answer to the question, uh, uh, or to answer the question, if uh, civilians in Thailand engage in blocking the formation of coup coalitions, address the problems of inequality, and do democratic coup proving. For me, it's just uh, the end to thank you for your attention. <laughs>